We want to begin by reading Ephesians chapter 4. This is uh, Paul the Apostle writing to the believers in Ephesus. And Paul says this in Ephesians 4 verse 1. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Make an allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body, one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. In the New Testament, the word church is the Greek word ekklesia. It comes from two words that mean out of or to call. When you put those two words together, our English words, in the Greek language, it is ekklesia. And that word ekklesia or church means something like this. It is the assembly of those who have been called out of the world to follow Jesus. The assembly of those who have been called out of the world to follow Jesus. This definition tells us that the church is about people. And strictly speaking, the church is the people who come together as believers in Jesus Christ. The church is not the building where we meet because you could take away the building and it would not harm the church at all. Now, we would never want to lose this building. We would never want it to be destroyed or, or burned down by fire. But should that happen, we would still be the church because this building is not what makes us the church. This beautiful campus that we find ourselves on that we call home is not the church because the church is made up of people. Sometimes as you read the New Testament, you see the word church as it refers to all of God's people around the world. And we call that the universal church. But most often the word church is used in the New Testament to refer to a group of believers in a particular location. And then we call it in church talk, we call that a local church. Harvest Ministries is part of the universal church, the church of all of God's believers around the world. And yet we are a specific, unique local church here in the Roanoke Valley. And so we can say we're part of the universal church and we are a local church. Both of those are valid to claim this morning. It includes true believers all around the world. And the church also manifests itself in millions of congregations around the world. But what does the church that Jesus is building look like? What are the characteristics of the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. The first characteristic is simply this. The church is one. The church is one. In our text, Paul uses the word one seven times to emphasize our fundamental unity as believers in Christ. There is one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father over all of us. Seven times he uses the word one. And it is this sevenfold unity that emphasizes the fact that Jesus is building one church. Not two churches, not three churches, not 10 churches, not 10,000 churches. He is building one church for himself. And the one church 
that he is building consists of all true believers who have been born again through their faith in Jesus Christ. And they are part of that church regardless of their denominational affiliation. When we finally stand before God one day, he will not ask us about our church affiliation. He will not ask us, were you a Baptist? Were you a Methodist? Were you Church of God? Were you Assemblies of God? Were you Pentecostal Holiness? God is not going to ask us that question on that day. On that day, he will ask only one question. What did you do with my son, Jesus? That's the question we're going to be asked. And the only thing that matters on that day is whether or not you trusted Jesus or you did not trust Jesus. There are genuine Christians in the Lutheran church. There are genuine Christians in the Methodist church and the Baptist church and the Episcopal church and in the Pentecostal church. There are true Christians in all of these churches and the list could go on and on and on. But are there unsaved people in these groups? Probably there are unsaved people in the Lutheran church and the Baptist church and the Methodist church, and the church of God. And if we really narrowed it down even to Harvest Ministries, we may have some unsaved members in our own church today. Hmm. But we don't want to talk about that this morning. God help us not to judge people solely by the religious denominational labels that they wear. Let us treat people as individuals and not simply as a group of people because God has people in many surprising places. And no doubt God has people in places that we would not have them if we were God. But the bottom line is this. We are not God. He is God. And God puts people in his body where he needs them to be at that moment. It's his body. Let me say this. God blesses a church where its members are quick to forgive where they are quick to allow for human weakness. God blesses a church where people put the needs of the church ahead of their personal feelings. And he blesses a church that is filled with peacemakers and not troublemakers. What are troublemakers? Well, you know some troublemakers, don't you? If you've ever worked a job, you've met some troublemakers on your job. They sow discord. They break the unity. They tear down what is trying to be built. But people who are troublemakers are selfish, and they think in terms of this, how does this affect me? How will this affect me? What does it mean to me and my life? Is this fair to me? Why didn't anyone call me and tell me about that? You are taking my rights away. Troublemakers are selfish people because it's all about them and how it affects them. Proverbs 6 gives us a list of things that God hates. It says God hates haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent, a heart that plots evil, feet that race to do wrong, a false witness who sows discord in the family or in the church. God hates those things. Let me say today that if you are a member of Harvest Ministries here or watching, and you... Uh, talk about me and criticize me and put me down and, and tear me down. You talk about our other staff members and, that are here and our other pastors here that are on staff and you are tearing them down and criticizing them. Listen, God hates it when you do that. God hates it. It's not blessed. It's not from God. It is something that God hates. And let me say that some pastor who may watch this later on today, if you are criticizing your members and tearing your members down and running your people down, God hates that just as much as well. God does not like people who sow discord and disunity and disrupt the harmony that he wants his church to have. Are there legitimate criticisms? Sure, there are legitimate criticisms. Are there complaints? Sure, there are complaints sometimes. But the difference in a troublemaker and a peacemaker is how you voice those differences and those complaints. Our communities are full of people that are unsaved, 
They are full of people that need to hear the good news that Jesus loves them and Jesus wants to save them. And we cannot reach our community because too many Christian churches are busy fussing and fighting and feuding over things that have zero eternal implications. Zero. And non-believers see us and they hear us and they watch us and they say, you're no different than anybody else I know. You're no different than me and I don't even go to church. Your attitude is worse than my attitude is. And we see people around us every day that are lost and, and unsaved, and yet they see the body of Christ fighting and feuding over things that really don't matter. Don't matter at all. Listen, I've been in some churches that you wouldn't dare put a chair like this in that church building because chairs aren't sanctified and holy. Only hard pews are sanctified and holy. And God can't move in a church building where there's not pews. You go in some churches, you can't sing the words off of screens like we do because God only works out of song books and hymn books. I don't think God gives a, uh, what word I want to say here now? <laughs> Can I say flip? Is that too strong? I don't think God gives a flip. Whether you sing it out of a book or sing it on a screen, he doesn't care if you got pews or you got chairs. He doesn't care if you're sitting on the ground in some third world country somewhere. God is building his church. God, we got to stop fighting amongst ourselves. I say all of this to say that some of you may need to Go to the person that was your pastor before you came to Harvest Ministries if you've been somewhere else, and maybe you ought to apologize to them for how you treated them, what you said about them. And there may be a pastor somewhere who needs to go to some of his church members who used to be members but maybe aren't there now, and maybe they should apologize to them as well. Why? So that the world around us, the community around us, can see that we are in unity together and see an example of the body of Christ being one, being one. Secondly, the church is holy. That word holy frightens people. For some people, it takes you back to a time when you were raised in a holiness tradition. And it conjures all kinds of ideas of religious hypocrisy. To say that the church is holy can almost seem to be holier than thou. The word holy simply means to be set apart for God. Anything that belongs to God is holy by mere association with God. Listen, if you're not holy, you can't get close to God. You hang out with God long enough, you're going to be holy. You're going to change what needs to be changed. Change your attitude, change your talk, change your thoughts. Change the way you treat people. The closer you get to God, the more you become like Christ and the more holy you become. The church is holy because the people in the church are holy. And the people of the church are holy because they belong to God and their salvation is through the blood of Jesus Christ. In another generation, some of you are much too young to even comprehend what I'm about to say. But in another generation, when a minister talked about being holy, he was referring to one of the four sins, drinking, smoking, dancing, and playing cards. That's a whole other generation. Some of you grew up in that generation. I grew up in that generation. Or it might have evolved beyond drinking and smoking and dancing and playing cards. And they might have preached against women wearing lipstick or men having long hair or women with skirts that were too short or listening to the, the wrong kind of music or even going to the movies. That was a thought of what holiness was. Sometimes the list of do-nots became so long that being a Christian was defined by what you did not do. And the less you did the more holy you were. 
for those of us raised up in this type of culture. We talk about it now. We swap stories with each other. We talk about the things we could and could not do growing up. And I don't laugh at the sincerity of my parents and my grandparents and my great-grandparents. I don't laugh and make fun of the sincerity of those people who thought that holiness was more of an exterior thing and really didn't teach that it was about something on the inside that made the outside live a holy life. They taught me the best. They, they showed me the best way that they knew how to show me that. But even as a child and a young adult growing up, I couldn't wear a pair of shorts. I couldn't go roller skating. First time I went roller skating, I was almost 40 years old. Over here in Roanoke. And the first time I strapped them on and went out, both feet went like this. And I went like that. And I probably said something that wasn't too holy to say, Brother Dale. And that was the last time I went roller skating. I blame my parents for not knowing how to roller skate today. I couldn't go roller skating. I couldn't go to the homecoming dance or couldn't go to the prom. We couldn't go swim in the public pools that were around us. And I know there are some places that we should not go. I know there are some things that we should not listen to or, or watch. I, I know that. But most of us know that Christianity is not simply a set of rules. And holiness is not a set of rules that you follow. In fact, 1 Peter says, but you, but you believers are chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Those four phrases describe who we are simply by virtue of God's grace. God saved us, and then he declared us his chosen people. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. Why? Because we belong to God. But that's not the end of the story. That verse goes on to say that God did this so that we may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous or wonderful light. This is where holiness becomes practical. We, the holy people of God, are to live so that we bring glory to God. Did you bring any glory to God this week by how you lived? Did you bring any glory to God by what you said? Did you bring any glory to God by the places that you went? Did you bring any glory to God by the Facebook post that you made? The, the tweet that you sent out? Did you bring any glory to God about that? Did you bring any glory to God with the neighbors that live around you by, by helping them or, or just being the light of Christ? Did you bring any glory to God this past week? That's why he saved us. That's why he set us apart. That's why he says, you're my holy people, my royal priesthood. Why? So you will bring glory to God. Not to yourself. Not to Harvest Ministries. Not to the church down the road. I'm afraid that if we're not careful, we will consider ourselves saved and holy and set apart and we'll begin to bring glory to ourselves and glory to our denomination and, and glory to our church when God says, you don't get any glory. I get all of the glory. I get all of the, the praise. I get all of the worship. It's all about him. To be holy means to go against the tide. And let me just say, the tide that's running through our nation and through our world today is going in the wrong direction. But when you're holy, you swim upstream. Because anything can float down with the stream. But you got to fight to go against the stream. This world is flowing into what I call a foul pit of destruction. Now, I believe that. It is just flowing into a foul pit of destruction. And what's happened over the years is the body of Christ has gotten so wrapped up in the world. We as individuals have gotten so wrapped up in what's going on around us, wrapped up in materialism, wrapped up in what our name is, and, and wrapped up in what we have and what we've accomplished. And instead of going against the stream, now the stream is carrying us further 
and further away from God. God is calling his people today to rise up and to stand up and to fight against the stream of destruction and to go against everything else. When everybody else goes this way, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ says, no, we've got to go this way. This is where our Father is. This is where our holiness is. This is where our salvation is. We've got to go this way. Holiness always involves rejecting the ways of darkness and walking in the light of God. The church is to be salt and light to the world. We sing that song sometimes, don't we? Salt and light. You know what salt is? Salt is a preservative. You cure meats with it. It preserves them. But salt is also an irritant, isn't it? You just cut your finger and you let some salt get in that thing. And you'll be washing and scrubbing and hopping around the house because it's, it's an irritant. Can I just say today that if the church does not irritate the world, then the church is not doing its job. We are salt, which preserves, but it also irritates. We need to be irritating the world or we are not doing our job. Dead things flow with the stream, but living things go against the stream. And God is calling us every day to swim upstream because he will give us the strength to do that. The church is one. The church is holy. Second, the church is universal. What does that mean? It means that the message of the gospel is for all people in all places and all situations. The gospel is for everybody. We find this emphasized in many places in the New Testament. Mark 16, 15 instructs us to preach the gospel to every nation. Jesus commands us to go and make disciples of every nation in Mark 28. We are told to be witnesses to the end of the earth in Acts 1. The church is to be universal in its outreach. But it's also to be universal in its makeup. We should expect and pray that our local church will somehow reflect God's heart for the entire world. When we pastored in Virginia Beach, what seems like a lifetime ago now, we observed this firsthand as the makeup of our church began to change. What started out as a predominantly white church, soon filled with African Americans and Bohemians and Jamaicans, and people from all the other Caribbean islands that you could think of. We had an influx of people from Hispanic nations around the world. Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Mexico, and Brazil, just to name a few. Our worship reflected the culture of these individuals. There were flutes and harps, and some kind of thing they called a fish that made noise when they rubbed it back and forth. All kinds of things that reflected their cultures. We were a veritable United Nations at that church. And when we moved from Virginia Beach to Roanoke, my family and I were the minority in our church. We had gone from the majority to the minority. And it was a beautiful thing to see happen. Because it showed me that we were reflecting the universal church that God has around the world. It's been said that Sunday morning is the most segregated day in America. I know that race and racism is a hot button issue in our nation right now. It is all over the news. It dominated in a large part our presidential election. But if there is one place where a person's skin color should not divide us, it is in the body of Christ. It should not divide us. And for those of you who are, were not raised Pentecostal and don't have a Pentecostal background, let me just give you some Pentecostal history here real quick. The Pentecostal church worldwide was the most inclusive of all churches 
and the nominations around the world. Go to Azusa Street. Look at William J. Seymour, one-eyed black man who goes and is filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, who leads what will become a worldwide movement, Pentecostalism. You could go to Azusa Street in the 1900s, and you would see white people and black people and Hispanic people together in a very segregated nation at that time, worshiping and praising God together. You'd see white people, black people, Hispanic people hugging each other laying hands on each other in prayer. You'd see black women preaching, Hispanic women preaching, white women preaching, unheard of at that time in the denominational world. And yet, Jesus said, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Some of you old men and young men are going to dream dreams and have visions. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. And God is still raising up a generation today, I believe, of men and women, young and old, white, black, brown, yellow. It doesn't matter what color they are. He's raising them up today. And he says, this is my church. Don't let it divide you. <laughs> oh, God. I'm probably going to step into it this morning, but I'm going to step on anyway. We should not be divided based on the color of our skin. If I've seen one thing throughout this election cycle, it has been this. I've seen brothers and sisters in Christ fight each other, criticize each other, belittle each other, call each other names. I know people that are no longer friends because they didn't have the same political ideology. They didn't think the same way. They didn't talk the same way. But yet they claim to be a part of the body of Christ. Listen, there is no division. There is no separation in the body of Christ. There is one body, one spirit, one God, one faith, one baptism. Baptism. It's only one. If you're part of the universal church, it's an exciting time because we are seeing the great commission being fulfilled as a harvest of souls comes from every tribe and nation and from every people group on the earth. It's a great time to be a part of the body of Christ. The church is one, the church is holy, the church is universal, the church is apostolic. What do I mean by apostolic? It simply means the church follows the doctrines preached by the apostles of Jesus Christ. It is not the apostles that we follow. It is their doctrine that we follow. Paul ran into this, had an issue. Some say I'm a Paul. Some say I'm of this person. Some say I'm of this person. And it's like, no, it's not me you're following. It's not that person you're following. It's Jesus Christ you're following. It's the doctrine that we have preached to you, the word of God that we have preached to you. All 27 books in the New Testament are part of the apostles' doctrine. So I don't know if the apostles' doctrine, and we'll get your New Testament out and read the New Testament. That's the apostles' doctrine. That's what it is. Just read it. You'll know what it is. And we are an apostolic church and movement. J2 Packer calls the church the supernatural society of God's redeemed people. Supernatural society. I like that because it reminds me that the church is not just an organization. The church is more than the Lions Club and the Kiwanis Club. It's more than the Red Hatters Club. It's more than the Scouts. It, it, it is beyond that. It is a supernatural society of God's redeemed and because the church belongs to God, it is a supernatural society of those whose lives had been transformed by Jesus Christ. The church. God never intended for you to do life by yourself. You've heard me say that repeatedly for 17 years almost. We were made to live together in unity with our brothers and our sisters. And let me just throw this little tidbit at you. There's a difference in uniformity and unity. There's a difference. There's a difference in uniformity and unity. We can all dress the same, all look the same, all talk the same, 
and say we're unified, but that doesn't mean you have unity just because you dress the same and talk the same and, and act the same. That could just be uniformity. Unity goes deeper than that. We were made to live in unity with our brothers and sisters in the church. Can you grow spiritually without a church? Maybe you can for a little while. But you can't grow spiritually for a lifetime without the church. That's not how God intended for it to be. We need the church. We need friendships. We need fellowship, discipleship. We need prayer and encouragement and support and worship. We need to be able to be corrected and redirected when necessary. Those are all the things the church offers to us. Many of us look at the United States and wonder, if you grew up in this nation, depending on your age, you really wonder, what happened to the nation we once knew? What happened to it? Things that we never imagined possible are common in our nation today. How did it happen so quickly and seem like it caught us unaware, standing flat-footed? As we look around us, the parable of the wheat and tares of Matthew 13 comes to mind. It tells us about a farmer who sowed wheat. And while he and everyone else was sleeping, someone came into the field and sowed weeds all over the field. I'm not a great farmer by any stretch of the imagination. Just ask my wife about that. But I know this much. The weed will overtake the seed every time. The weed will overtake the plant every time. Every time. No doubt about it. 100% of the time. The weed always wins in the garden unless you do something about it. And I believe this is what happened in America. While the church slept relatively unbothered, relatively left alone, an enemy came in among the believers and sowed seeds of evil and destruction. The enemy sowed seeds of anti-faith and anti-God and anti-church. But I still believe that when Christians come together and we work and we pray and we worship, that amazing answers come from God. Why is that? Because we are part of the supernatural society of God's redeemed people. People ask you this week, what church do you go to? Well, I go to Harvest Ministry. Let me tell you something. I'm part of the supernatural society of the redeemed people. That's who I really belong to. I'm a part of something that is supernatural. Man didn't make it. Man can't stop it. Man can't hinder it. Governor Northam can't stop it. The president can't stop it. Whatever they say, however they push us down, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ will get back up over and over and over again. <laughs> Why? It's supernatural. Man, so I must need to have a supernatural encounter with God today. Some of us need to have our supernatural tanks refilled again. Some of us need to let us say, show us your glory. And really mean when we say, show us your glory. Let us see something supernatural again. My God, our churches have become gathering houses and, and clubs and, 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 and gathering places where we just get together and talk. No, God, show us your glory. Show us your glory. Show us your glory again. Mm. We are better and stronger when we find our place in the church. And the church is better and stronger when we are here. I'll be honest with you. I suspected us have to have people sitting downstairs this morning with all the internet fury I saw about these new regulations coming out. I really did. Oh, going to stop us from going to church. Oh, after midnight tonight, we can't go to church. Well, look at all the empty seats around you. Did it really bother you that much? Did it really hinder you that much? Were you really that mad about it? Or did it just look good on social media? Did it just sound good to your friends? Were you just trying to stir the pot up a little bit more? Listen, God doesn't need you to stir the pot up. God wants you to be salt and light to those around you. Oh, Lord have mercy. I'd like to take all those pot stirrers and bust their pots one time. Amen. 
have a Holy Ghost pot busting time. Where were you? Where are you? Huh? Hmm. Church is a place we learn from each other. We rub shoulders with each other. It's where we learn how to become a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. All of us have our own ideas about music and worship and preaching. All of us have our own idea of what the church should do and how it should go forward. But if you're in church long enough, you will soon discover that every saint is not always saintly. And that the people of God are not always godly people. Sometimes they can be cantankerous, mean-spirited, unkind, and sometimes downright cruel. But in the nitty-gritty of life, with all of his disappointments and rude awakenings, we discover the Holy Spirit is working in us. You see, in a church, you are thrown together with people that you might never normally associate with. But when you find the church that you want to call home, you're just thrown into that family. And you think, man, <laughs> you know, you know, I wouldn't have chose this family for myself. Some of you feel that way about your own natural family. You know, I wouldn't have chosen this family for myself. I just got thrown in with a bunch of crazies, and, and they're just off the chain, and they do all these weird things. And some of you are in Harvest Ministries. Sort of, I don't know why I'm in Harvest Ministries. That's a crazy bunch of people. I don't like how the preacher preaches. I can't stand the worship service. I don't like anything about it. But for some reason, God has got me there. Well, you find yourself around people you wouldn't normally associate with and be with. This is a good thing because God uses all kinds of people to shape us and mold us and to make us what he wants us to be. As I come to the end of this message, I think, let me just say that I am a lifer in church. I was a church baby. And then I became a church boy. And then I became a church teenager. And now I'm a church adult. Church is all I have known. I've been to so many church services, I can't count them all. I've been to prayer meetings and home meetings Small groups to Sunday school. I've been to more potluck dinners than you can shake a stick at. Church picnics, church hay rides, church Christmas plays, revivals, business meetings. I've been in the pulpit and I've been in the pew. I've served communion and I've been served communion. I've baptized and I've been baptized. And I've seen the good and I've seen the bad. And when the church is good, it's really good. But when it's bad, it's really bad. But through it all, I still believe that God has a church and he has a people. Weak at times, fallible at times, it needs improvement sometimes, and yet the body of Christ still remains the best hope for the world. Where would the world be without the church? As bad as the world is today, it would be immeasurably worse without the church of Jesus Christ. With no Christian influence, what a sad place we would live in. I'm going to challenge you, Harvest. Let your Christian light shine. Be an influencer. Don't hide. Don't light that candle and put it under a basket, as the sister says. But take the basket away and let everybody see your light shining for Jesus. Let me make it more personal. Where would Roanoke be without Harvest Ministries? We're not the only church in Roanoke. There are the gospel uh, ch preaching churches in our community, and we thank God for their ministry. But what if Pastor Elroy Loman had not started what is now known as Harvest Ministries more than 50 years ago? Or what if he had taken that church he started and moved it to some other town or some other city? I believe Roanoke and the surrounding areas need us. Even if some people don't appreciate our presence, I still think they need us. Jesus said, I will build my church, his church, 
Not Pastor Atkins' church, not any other pastor's church, his church. He is building his church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. His church is a universal church. He's not building a white church or a black church or a brown church or a Hispanic church or an Asian church. He's building one church with all people from all over the world. His church. And he said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus uses a very familiar terminology when he talks to the disciples in this verse when he mentions the gates. The gates in his day were where important businesses were transacted. It's where the elders met to debate and to pass judgment. It's where the military leaders met to discuss and to draw up battle plans. I want you to know today that Satan is drawing up plans to destroy our church. And he will use any means possible to destroy pastors and members because we are what makes up the church. There have and will be times when the enemy comes in like a flood but the Lord will protect his church and he will turn the enemy aside. Jesus said it very plainly, even if the total resources of hell are unleashed against the church, they will not conquer it. The church will prevail. No weapon formed against the church will prosper. It's not gonna happen. It's not because of anything we say or do, but it's simply because Jesus said so. Individual churches fluctuate, they go up and down. Pastors come and go. People come and people leave. Some churches fall prey to false doctrine. Some leaders disappoint us. But the church will prevail. Why? Because Jesus said so. The church will prevail and his word will not be broken. So in light of this, what should we do, Harvest? First, you should pray for the church. You should love the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You should join in with the work of the church. You should serve in the church. You should support the church. You should get involved in the church. And let me say it this way. You should make Harvest Ministries better by being a part of it. Harvest Ministries ought to be better because you're a part of it, not worse because you're a part of it. It ought to be better because I'm a part of it and not worse because I'm a part of it. Let's all do our part to make it better. The church is one. The church is holy. The church is universal. And the church is apostolic. Let's pray this morning. Father, I love you today. I thank you for your word because your word is true. I thank you for your word because it gives us an outline and a blueprint for the church you are building, not the church we're building. Help us not to see our fellow brothers and sisters who are not a part of Harvest Ministries as our enemy or as people to be belittled or disliked. If they are saved and they are our brothers and our sisters and they're part of your church. Help us to live a holy life before you, Lord. Not an external holiness, but a holiness that is produced because of a change of heart and a change of attitude. Let us see your church as a universal church. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every race. Let us see our fellow brothers and sisters this way. And finally, Father, help us to be an apostolic church. Let us believe the apostles' teaching the apostles' doctrine. Help us not to get so caught up in this world and what's going on around us that we forget that there's a heavenly home waiting for us. There's a place beyond this world that we can't even imagine or fathom that you've gone to prepare for us. Let us not get so bogged down with this life that we forget about our eternal life. For Lord, we're going to spend much more time on the other side than we do on this side. I pray for anyone watching today or listening to me right now who may not know you as their Savior. As they think about their eternity, maybe they'll pray a very simple prayer and simply say, Dear Jesus, 
come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. I want to serve you from this day forward. Help us, Lord, to be the church that you call us to be. Help us to represent you well wherever we go and whatever we do. And help us this week to bring glory to your name. Help us to bring glory to your name. I pray this in Jesus' name. Church says amen. 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 Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for listening and receiving the word today. I want to just quickly talk about our offering this morning. We put out on Facebook and made a call yesterday to re- just tell you about a special offer we're going to be receiving this morning. Last year, our Mission Possible group, and many of you are part of this group, were able to send a financial gift to about 16 missionaries and their families around the world at Christmas time. They also sent money to the orphanages in Rwanda and Uganda. Uh, they helped support a feeding program in Malawi. And the response from the people who received those financial gifts was just, uh, just amazing. Some of them said it was the only uh, Christmas gift they received, and they were able to help not only their families, but also the people that they care for as well. Every year, our Mission Apostle group does Christmas fundraisers. For years, some of you have been buying candy and fudge and cheese balls and soups and and all kinds of things, uh, eating a meal here. We can't do any of that with COVID this year. It just has changed everything. We were in contact with uh, Kathy Payne. Many of you know Kathy Payne, our international missions director for our organization. And she said her heart was broken this year because missions giving is so decreased because of COVID-19. It's just, it's just gone down astronomically. And the help we're able to give missionaries around the world from our international church offices, that is, has taken a hit as well. So, the Bible says you have not because you ask not. And I think sometimes we just ask for small things and don't ask for the big thing. And so I said yesterday, if you received the call or saw it online, we're going to ask you to give sacrificially today, if you haven't already given, a sacrificial offering. We want to raise $5,000. For this effort this year. Maybe somebody watching, maybe somebody here could sit down and write a check for $5,000. And that would be fantastic. Maybe you have that ability to do that. And we would take that check and put it with whatever else we get. So let me just say that. We would take that and, and, and apply it. But most people don't have that ability to just sit down and write a $5,000 check. But you have the ability to give something. You know, if 50 people or 50 families gave $100, we'd knock it out. We'd be done with it, right? Just pss, done. It's over with. Maybe you could write more than $100 or give more than $100. And we know that our nation, and some of you, have been hit hard by the pandemic as well. But I'm going to ask you to give sacrificially this morning. There's a saying in our nation that Americans live above their means. Have you heard that? We live above our means. What if we change one letter in that word live and replace the L with a G? And we would say that we at Harvest Ministries give above our means. Doesn't it sound better to say you give above your means than you live above your means? Doesn't that sound better? That makes you feel good. I give above my means. And so I don't know what you can give today. I don't know your financial situation. But I'm just asking you to please give generously for this offering today. You know a lot of these missionaries. They've been here. They've been on the stage. They've spoken. You've eaten meals with a lot of these folks. They've come over, and they weren't able to do that this year because of COVID. But we want to bless them this morning. So you can give online if you're watching, if you're here, harvest-ministries.org. You can go give on the website anytime. You can give through the Tidely app if you want to give using that app. 
Uh, so many of you started using the Tidely app. Thank you for doing that. You can text to give. You can take out your phone right now and just text that number on the screen. And you can text to give the amount that you want to give. Uh, or if you're watching or you're here and you didn't plan on doing this, you can mail an offering in to Harvest Ministries, 909 Blue Ridge Boulevard, Roanoke 24012. Those are all the ways that you can give. If you want to drop something in the offering basket on the way out, there's a, a, a giving station back there. You can just drop an envelope or check or cash in there, and we'll apply that to this offering today. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me, and I want to have a prayer for our offering for our missionaries, and then we'll let you be dismissed. Father, we love you today again. I pray for all of our missionaries that are part of the Harvest Ministries family. For these men and women have worked tirelessly, some are working under conditions that uh, we, we can't even imagine some of the conditions they find themselves working in and living in. And they don't have the benefit of the United States. They don't have the health care system we have. We don't, they don't have access to simple masks like we have or other cleaners and sanitizers like we may have in this nation. So, Lord, we pray for them. We pray for their protection. We pray for the protection of their family and our church family in these nations. And thank you for those who are going to give today. I know, Lord, normally we buy something and get something in return for our money, but today we're not giving to receive anything. We're just giving to be a blessing to others who are less fortunate than we are. Take this offering, Lord. I've asked for $5,000. You could turn it to $10,000 if you wanted to. You can make it $20,000. Little is much when you're working inside of it. And so bless those who give today. Bless those online who are going to give whatever the amount is. As they give sacrificially, let us go from living above our means to giving above our means and let the blessings flow into their lives and into their finances, I pray in Jesus' name. And the church says amen one more time. Amen. amen. God bless you this morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, as far as I know, we'll be back here next Sunday morning. Stay safe. Practice all the guidelines. And let's have a great week glorifying God. Let's dismiss by sections. Let's let this section go over here. And the two far sections. We'll let the two far sections go this morning first.